Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. <clears throat> Joining us now is Dr. Richard Baratta, Senior Vice President, Biomechanical Practice for the Rimkus Consulting Group. Dr. Baratta got his degree in biomedical engineering from Tulane University in New Orleans, and his areas of focus are in injury causation biomechanics, accident reconstruction, medical device failures, and of course, IP. He's fluent in English and Spanish and has testified both in depositions and trials in both Mexico and the United States. He's here today to talk to us about slip, trip, stumble and fall, biomechanical issues in these slips and falls. And he's going to distinguish for us between these terms, which we all need to learn about. Let's welcome Dr. Varadha. Uh, thank you, Mr. Barth. Uh, I uh, appreciate uh, your invitation. And uh, just uh, a, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you hear loud meowing, it's my administrative assistant who may insist on coming in or leaving my office. And, and I apologize <laughs> ahead. It, it's already happened a few times uh, in depositions uh, in the uh, era of COVID and, and, and law by, by Zoom. Um, we are going to be dealing with, uh, you know, most of the time we see the term slip and fall, and, and, and we, we certainly see a, a large number of slip and, and falls, but oftentimes th there can be a distinction between a slip and fall and a trip and fall, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about the distinctions between those, and, and we also have something that we see in the claims arena, and that I'll just call a, a stumble. And, and by that, I mean that sometimes there are some, some intrinsic gait disturbances that result in a fall and, and, and somebody may roll their ankle or stumble and ultimately end up uh, suing a, a, uh, the premises where, where this occurs. Uh, I am the lead of the biomechanical practice at Rimkus and I've been uh, in this business of, uh, of, uh, of consulting for 16 years, and prior to that, I spent 16 years as a professor of uh, orthopedic surgery, uh, even though I'm not an orthopedic surgeon. Most of the work that I have done throughout most of my life has dealt with understanding human mechanics, looking at the human body as a uh, piece of, of engineering, uh, and then understanding how it works. Now, when we talk about, about falling, it, we need to talk about gait, and gait is the fancy word that we use to describe walking. So it, it is a cyclical event. It is a cycle that repeats itself and alternates between the legs. And, uh, and, and normally, what we, what we call point zero in the gait cycle is heel strike. That is that moment with, within which your, your heel makes contact with the ground. And and something special about heel strike is that the moment of heel strike is when a number of slip events occurs. Now, after your, your heel strikes, your center of mass continues to move forward, and we come to sit what we call single leg support or single leg stance. And that is when, when, when now you, we normally would have both the heel and the ball of the foot, the forefoot, both making contact with the ground as the other side leg is, is swing, uh, swings. Then we have, uh, at the end of that, we have what we call toe off or, or push off. And that, that is that moment, which typically through the toes, primarily the big toe, uh, we, we, we thrust. This is another point for, uh, for a potential slip and fall uh, or a potential slip. Now, immediately after that, we lift our leg and we, we need some clearance to the ground in order, and th these are things that are kind of obvious, but, but, but become troublesome in the context of, uh, of, of a claim. So we, we need to lift our leg and that leg needs to swing until we come across to our next toe off. And, and that brings us to 50% of the gait cycle 
And after we have hit that 50% of the gait cycle, then we transition to the other, other, to the other leg. Um, so if you look at, at the first and the last parts, uh, uh, the last figures here, they're the same, except that they have, uh, the, the legs are switched. Now, when we, when we talk specifically, oh, let me back up here. Most of the time it is during that swing process that trips occur. And, uh, and, and also some stumbles. So, so, so we normally either heel strike or toe off for trips, swing for, excuse me, for slips and uh, swing for, for trips. Now, when, because we focus so much on walking, let's talk about, uh, let's talk a little bit about the geometry of, of walking. Now, I'm sure that since most folks here are attorneys, I'm sure that everybody here really loved geometry and really loved physics. So if, if you do, if you think about if you think about the way that we walk when our when our foot strikes the the ground, the foot, the ground has to provide two different forces. It has to provide a vertical force because otherwise our foot would sink into the ground. But it but it also has to provide a horizontal force that resists slip. Now, uh, if you look at these angles, uh, this angle that is a, a Greek letter beta here, um, that is the angle at which from, from vertical that your foot is striking at. And the greater that angle is, the greater that horizontal, foot, uh, that horizontal force needs to be. And where our brains are actually doing the geometry, if you think about when we are walking on a very slippery surface, let's say that you know that you're walking on ice, our, our first strategy is to shorten our step length. And by shortening our step length, we reduce that amount of that horizontal force. And by reducing the amount of that horizontal force, the ground needs to provide less, less uh, slip, uh, less friction. And so that's how we manage walking on, 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 on ice, for example, we take shorter steps to reduce that horizontal force. Um, and this is at one half step length. And of course, it's a symmetric process when we go from one side to the other. Now, the two types of, of incidents or, or that, that may or may not lead to falls, uh, we have- That we had of the 2018 or 2019. Uh, yeah, Charlie, have a Charlie, in here. yeah, Charlie Brune, can you mute your line, please? Um, yeah. Oh, I see it. So, so first we have what we see most frequently in 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 the claims arena is slips, and and a slip is when that horizontal force is insufficient to prevent the foot from sliding, and when that happens, you place your foot, it begins to slide. Most of the time, a slip happens in in, in at the moment of, 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 uh, of heel strike. Now, one of the things that is critically important is this. When uh, friction is a function of two surfaces or the interaction between the two surfaces. And, uh, and so the, the owner of a premises or the manager, people at the premises have control over one of those two surfaces. Footwear is the second one. Now, when we look at friction testing that civil engineers and some, some of us do as well, we have a standard friction surface that we use. And that standard friction surface is neolite. But, and, and so we can only refer to that standard. When one of the things that, that a take home here is when we have a slip event and we know that we have a slip event or we suspect that we have a slip event, we should pay attention to people's footwear and also in trips. Why? Because if you have, and, and I've seen this in some cases, uh, in some high profile cases where, where the floor appears to be okay in terms of friction, but then the person who slipped uh, had very worn shoes and those shoes by being very worn, by being very worn, then uh, did not give a whole lot of that second element of friction and the person uh, slipped because of that. Uh, so that's, that's one type of claim that we see most frequently, and that can be legitimately an, an event. The second type is a trip. And that trip 
occurs most of the time in the, in the midst of the swing phase when there is some obstruction to the mo movement of that swing foot as it's traveling from behind the center of mass to, to in front of the center of mass and beyond, and beyond the other foot. One thing about a trip is that, or about the obstruction is that the obstruction does not need to be very high. As long as, if that obstruction is higher than the clearance of the foot, there's a potential for a, a trip. <clears throat> and going back to the question that I asked, that, that I was mentioning before about trips and slips, is that sometimes when you have soles that are loose or the tip of the sole, the front of the sole at the front of the, uh, of the shoe, if that is loose, that can hang a little bit low. And if it does, it might initiate a, uh, a, a trip. So just something to keep in mind, footwear is critically important in most of these cases. Now, one of the things that we always talk about is momentum. Now, when normally when we have a slip, the foot can go in generally in any dimension. Most of the time it happens at heel strike as I've, as I've mentioned a couple of times. And the most, most commonly that because the horizontal forces from forward, front to back that the ground needs to provide, the foot slips forward and, and people tend to go down, but they can fall in any direction depending upon which direction the foot may slide because it may not slide directly forward. There's always some lateral motion in our gait pattern that may move, uh, move the leg in a different direction. Uh, now, for trips, generally people will fall in the direction that they're moving because what's happening is that the leg that is transitioning from being behind the center of mass to in front of the center of mass stops and the center of mass continues to go forward and then if you don't have that anti-gravity support, then you keep going forward. And, and if there's nothing there to stop you from falling, then gravity takes over. So most trips are in the forward direction if the person is walking forward. Uh, once or twice, you'll, come, you'll see that in, in a rear direction. Now, one of the things that sometimes gets, gets masked as a trip or a slip is things that are essentially gait disturbances. And, and these happen frequently in stairs. Now, when you have stairs and we consider what is the potential hazard in stairs, well, there's friction, right? If, if the stairs themselves are slippery or lack of uniformity. So there are some standards, civil engineering standards that tell you what is the uniformity of the different steps. We, when we walk, we use what we call a central pattern generator. And our brain basically counts on the first few steps to calculate what our, our descent is going to be like. And then if there's more uniformity than we're expecting or less uniformity and, and there's a difference in the height or in the, or in the length of the steps, that can initiate a, uh, that can initiate a trip and, and a fall down steps. And obviously once you add gravity or once you add height to a fall, you add energy to a fall so you can add severity to the, uh, to, the, to, to, the, to the injuries. Next thing, and this is something that we see sometimes and uh, is people rolling their ankles. And more frequently we see it on, on women using high heels where, where somebody may roll the ankle and fall and, and then say, I slipped or I tripped. And, and I had a very interesting case where, where that luckily it was on video where a lady rolled her ankle and fell at a retail facility. And after she fell, a, uh, a clerk, a stocking clerk, who thought was doing the right thing, came with a wet floor sign uh, so people would avoid this lady. And then when it came back in the lawsuit, they say, well, you know, this guy came in and said the other floor was wet. And that was never his intention. But, but so we need to look at sometimes at some of the gate disturbances that can make us fall. So. Uh, rolling your ankle is one or simply stumbling because you didn't clear and you stumble and then you fall, which looks very much like a trip. Uh, the other thing is once in a while, we end up with hip fractures. And this generally is in, in older females that we have situations where you have some uh, change in elevation and by change in elevation, you have change in the energy and you can end up with, with a hip fracture. 
And sometimes we come across the question of chicken or the egg. When you have a, a sideways fall, did the person break their femoral neck, which would normally look like the, like the top left, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but around here, uh, like it may look like an intertrochanteric uh, fracture, uh, but it, it fractured first and then the person fell. Or if the person falls sideways, then they can fall sideways and end up with also the same kind of fracture or, or maybe a fracture of the femoral neck. So, so sometimes there's that question of whether a fall caused an injury or a fracture caused a subsequent fall. And it's very frequently, we rush to make measurements. We, 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 somebody falls immediately, we send a civil engineer to look at friction and that might be relevant or it might not. Uh, so one of the things is, let's first what happened uh, to understand the mechanics of the fall, which is the, the kind of thing that, that biomechanical folks do, uh, and to understand directly relevant parameters. And, and sometimes it, it is as much a question of avoid raising parameters that are not relevant. So let's say if you have a, a trip and you immediately send somebody to look at slip, and the slip is below that magic number of 0.5, that friction, that, that coefficient of friction is below that magic number of 0.5, which is completely arbitrary, then you're exposing yourself to, to, to that question of, well, you know, was this, was this a slip or, or your floor was slippery and that's, that's why they failed. And they might have nothing to do with that. Uh, so, you know, I think that it's, it's important to get some basic understanding of what happened uh, uh, from experts. So get expert her help early so that you can quickly define what are the technical issues that need to be dealt with and look at relevant, uh, relevant measurements uh, before any changes are made. Let's say, for example, when, we, when we're dealing with friction, it might very well be that, that let's say, just changing of cleaning agents might, might change the friction. Or I've had the situation where I had somebody fall, and by the time the lawsuit came around and they 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 came to me, the building had been demolished. So so much for measurements. Um, other things that we can help you with is understanding motions, uh, human factors, because sometimes other things are are in play here, uh, visibility or lighting. There may be insufficient lighting, and somebody trips against something that they just couldn't see. Obstructions. Uh, not constriction, but construction areas, uh, falls from height. And then whether somebody is carrying objects, that can change how they move or how they fall. If, if people strike objects either before the fall or during the fall. And then understanding what are the injuries and what are the mechanisms. And then understanding what are the diagnoses that are rendered afterwards versus the direction of fall. And I'm, I'm, I'm showing a few examples here on the right. When let's say somebody falls forward and falls on their knees, well, that opens up the for a series of, of injuries. But if somebody falls backwards, right, then the set of injuries that you'll have might be completely different. Is if you fall back, you might be looking at injuries to the tailbone, to the shoulder, to the to the wrist. If you fall forward, you might be looking at fractures of the of the kneecap. You might be looking at posterior cruciate ligament injuries. So understanding which way the person fell in the context of what the injuries were diagnosed can be important and can be helpful in understanding what, what are the issues at hand in the case or how it began. Uh, I was asked to keep it short. Hopefully that was uh, short enough. And I uh, thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I think if there's any question of core comments, I'd uh, love to hear them. Thanks, Doc. Great information. A lot of us are involved in that type of litigation, but we, we really don't understand the mechanics. That was a, a great, great summary of what, what we need to be thinking about there. I want, ladies and gentlemen, to remind you the chat is available to ask your questions or feel free to chime in. Doc, I've got a question. It's not really in the biomechanical sphere, but in your experience, let's start with the hotels and then we can talk about restaurants. But if we were gonna prioritize our prevention techniques, where would you suggest we begin? Is that a fair question? 
Uh, it, it, is a, it is a very fair question. And, and I think that where we would begin is uh, a couple of things. Number one is making sure that our, our surfaces are uniform or as uniform as is reasonable and are as slip resistant as, as reasonable. And then the next one is visibility. Uh, oftentimes we have transitions that people don't see. And, uh, and, and, and as is the case many times when we deal with design, uh, sometimes we, we, do, we do something to pre, in, as, a, as a preventive measure and it ends up causing problems. Let's say uh, sometimes when people put the big rugs to, uh, or, or the big mats in front uh, of doors, uh, if, if those mats are not down all the way, they can roll up and initiate trips. And so, so I, I think that the big keys are uniformity, slip resistance, visibility, or lighting. Of course, that, that would go for hotels and restaurants or, or, or yes. meeting venues, right? So yes. that's helpful to do and that. Anywhere where you have a lot of, a lot of people. And, you know, but then, for example, when we look at the, at the restaurant ar arena, th there's always a few cases that stick in your mind. Uh, we, we had a case at a, at a, at a, at a high-end restaurant where a lady slipped. And, and once we looked at the mechanics, there was no question that she slipped. And when they did, when we did uh, friction measurements in the area where she fell, uh, those friction measurements were 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 fine. Were I think 0.7, and you know that magic number is 0.5. And then the uh, the the plaintiff attorney sent the plaintiff expert to go right by the door where they go from the from the kitchen, where the the the, the servers come out uh, into and out of the kitchen, and they took a measurement. They took a friction measurement there. And guess what? Right there where people are walking in and out, uh, it was below that magic number of 0.5. And they attempted to raise that point. And, and, and the answer was, well, it may have been over there, but that's not where she fell. And she didn't walk through that area to get to the, to the point where, where she did fall. And that was that case where we were able to retrieve the, her footwear. And it was very clear. It was one of these uh, platform shoes, wood platform shoes, with uh, rubber uh, below the rubber, the rubber had worn through to the effect that you had wood on wood, which is uh, a suboptimal friction situation. That, that, that is interesting. Can you talk just a little bit more for those folks that are with us that really don't understand the slip resistance, the coefficient uh, concept? I know you, you keep mentioning the, the, the right. The magical number, just a little bit of how that's arrived and why you. I think I heard you say you thought it was a little arbitrary. Help, help us to understand your, your thoughts about that, if you don't sure. mind. That that that, that let, let's start here. When 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 the foot comes down, then the the ground has to provide a frictional force to prevent it from slipping. Now the way that the the, the and friction is the force that that allows that to happen. Now we. We make measurements that, are, that we call friction coefficient. And generally, the, the simplest way to think about it is imagine that you have a 50 pound weight and then you pull on it until it starts to slide. How much force does it take for it to slide? And that number is always, always, always below that weight. So, so basically, so you, one of the basic ways to do it is to have literally a 50 pound weight with a sole underneath it, which is which simulates a shoot, which uh, simulates footwear, and you pull on it and you measure how much force, and uh, and then the ratio of the two. So if it takes let's say twenty five pounds to start moving it, then uh, that that number is twenty five divided by fifty, which is 0. 0.5. Now, people can successfully walk with friction. So then, and the higher that number is, the closer it is to one the more slip resistant the surface is. The closer it is to zero, the less slip resistant it is. Now, for, for reference, ice is about 0.1, give or take. Now, and, and uh, dry tile should be about 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Wet tile can be much lower than that. And so, because once you have a lubricant in between, then that friction comes down. Now, there is a, the, the, it basically, civil engineers have decided that a, a number that they're going to call sort of that cutoff value of 0 0.5. Now, we know that people can successfully walk during normal gait 
with uh, friction coefficients about of about 0.3. So you can, if the friction coefficient is about 0.3, you should be able to walk with a normal gait. You might not be able to run though. Uh, so, because that stride length is longer. Uh, and, and so, so generally, if there's a slip event, you, you'll hire an engineer and an engineer will bring some sort of machine, which can be from uh, quite literally a 50 pound weight with a surface and a force gauge uh, to some, some other types of systems that are meant and the most popular of which is what we call the English Excel, which is meant to simulate a foot strike on the ground. And if that number, when, if that magic number is above uh, 0.5, then you should be okay. If the number is below 0.5, then you might be in trouble. But what some of the civil engineers say is that that, that is a starting point, but, but, but ultimately the question is what went wrong or what did the, 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 the managers of the premises do wrong for that to go above or below 0.5 or whether that was relevant to a person uh, slipping. More than once have I had a case where after we examine what really happened in, in the accident, uh, what was initially defined as a slip and fall is ultimately decided that it was a trip. And, and so then all of these things that everybody was thinking are very different, are, 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 well, in, in reality are, are quite different. That's, that's interesting. Thanks for explaining that in terms that I could understand and I appreciate that greatly. I want to shift gears for just a minute. The same principles then apply to a bathtub, right? Because in hotels, we have a lot of slips and falls, uh, slips, trips, and falls, and, and you know, people slipping in the tub, you know, or tripping, getting in and out of the tub, right? So those distinctions become important then as well? It, very much so. And, and, and the thing about tubs, though, is that a, a, the, the acceptable friction coefficient on a tub is far, far, far lower than the acceptable friction coefficient on, on, a, on a walking surface. So I, I, I think the number, the, the number is very low, and I don't want to quote it because it just seems comically low, but I think it's, it's, it's less than 0.1. And, and the other thing about the tubs is that there is only one type of device that is approved by, by ASTM, which is the, this committee that sets up standards. There's only one type of device that is, that is deemed acceptable to look at friction in bathtubs, whereas there's a number of different types of devices or methods that are, that are acceptable for, uh, for looking at friction in, in, in walking surfaces. So for most walking surfaces, uh, you can use basically a weight with a scale, or you can use this English Excel that I mentioned before. However, if you are, if we are in a in a tub, there is one device, and it's called a Brungraber, or Brungraber, right? uh, and it's a very big uh, thing that is kind of a hassle to deal with, uh, which is the only acceptable way of looking at or accepted way of looking at friction in a, in a tub. And in tubs, we also get that situation where sometimes now to get out of a tub, you need much more clearance than to, than to take a normal step. And we do see on occasion, you have uh, stumbles coming out of a tub. And the thing that is, that is very interesting or very different from somebody falling off a tub is that when you fall off a tub, it involves quicker rotation of the body than it does when you when you don't have that kind of because you're 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 rotating over not over your foot but you're rotating over something that might be 14 or 15 inches high and then you rotate more quickly because your your moment of inertia is less around that and people end up rotating quickly and you have a greater propensity for head injuries let's say than you would if you just were walking and 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 fell that is fascinating. And, and just, just real quickly, when we add these uh, strips into the bottom of the tub, we're trying to enhance the friction. Is that fair? And in, in your exactly. opinion? We, we, yeah. en we enhance the friction, yeah. which is great for that because we see those more frequently. But of course, that doesn't quite deal with the trips, but the, but the trips are mostly in the coming yeah. in and out. 
and and now for example what we see in tubs we, we see the proliferation of these these uh walk in and out tubs that that have yeah. the doors or or or, or the, low, the low the low low showers that yeah. it, that don't require quite the same clearance as an old school type of bathtub very good i've often thought that in europe when I've traveled there, most of their showers have the removable shower head, uh, making it much easier to wash, you know, the lower part of your body than just a typical shower. Uh, and I felt like we sh might think about adopting that in the U.S. as a more popular practice. Do you agree or is that just, uh, is a regular shower head just as helpful? Well, well I, I think that as a matter of convenience, it, it surely ma makes a difference. And, and the, other, the, the other thing that might be different is that it, it reduces the need for you to, to do things with a single-legged stance, which we sometimes have to do with, with the other one. But so if, if you have somebody that has some kind of motor impairment and who has some difficulties with a single-legged stance, then that would certainly make a big difference. But if, you know, if, you don't, if, you, if we're not starting from there, then 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 you know at least convenience yes safety eh, not so much <laughs> okay thank you very much Doug, this has been fascinating conversation thank you for sharing your time and insight with us today just terrific any any final thoughts you'd like to leave the audience with uh, yes uh and and it's it's one of the it's the final thought here is as soon as you know that something like this is happening, get someone to help you understand really what happened in terms of the mechanics of the human being. Because in the end, right, you're defending premises, but at the center of it is a human being who either was injured or thinks they were injured. Great, great way to leave us. Thank you, doctor. Dr. Richard Barada with Remkus, biomechanical expert. Thank you kindly.